Welcome everybody uh, on YouTube uh, to another uh, short speedrun episode. Uh, in the last one, we focused on five minute chess. So you've been playing quite a bit of, of Blitz and I hope that you've enjoyed the, the high level up-tempo action. But uh, we also got to keep our, <clears throat> our standard rating moving uh, so that we could keep uh, cycling through the various levels. So let's start with a 10 minute game and then take it from there. Okay, let's jump into the pool. We're almost 1300, so kind of entering intermediate level. Thank you, Slick Shame, for the five subs uh, to start off the speedrun. And a Sicilian. All right, knight f3d6. Will we get a knight orf? I think we might have gotten, at most, two knight orfs so far. And uh, that number will remain very small. Bishop b5 check. So this particular uh, line is alternately known as either the Moscow variation. That's kind of how it was introduced to me. But on chess.com, it's labeled the canal attack. Um, I think these two names are sort of interchangeable. <clears throat> uh, you might kind of have the, the general name Rosolimo uh, in your mind, but the Rosolimo is bishop b5 after knight c6, specifically, which is actually a completely different opening and uh, carries quite a bit more, more teeth, let's say, than bishop b5 check uh, in this position, which we've never faced before. Uh, so this is a good opportunity for me to uh, kind of bring you up to speed on my my recommendation against this move because it has gotten very popular in recent years. I play it myself with white uh, at a high level, and you should definitely know what to do. So essentially, all three moves are possible. There are four legal moves. We won't talk about queen to d7. The other three moves, knight c6, knight d7, and bishop d7, are all completely viable continuations. But I think that the, the move which... Uh, is both the most challenging, like the best way to fight for an advantage, uh, as well as the most theoretically sound, is knight to d7. And I'll kind of explain everything about this move after the game. I don't have time to, to really lay the groundwork properly. Right now, let's focus on reacting to our opponent's response, which is actually not the correct approach. Knight to c3 is obviously not a mistake. Right? This move cannot be a mistake, but it's definitely not among white's most testing responses. The, the traditional main line is d4. Uh, the kind of modern move is actually to castle kingside. So what do we do after knight to c3? Well, basically, the, the point of, of knight to d7 is that we're going to play the move a6 eventually, and we're going to try to grab the bishop pair, because it doesn't really make sense for white to give the check on b5 and then to move the bishop back, you know, to like e2. But there is really no big rush to play the move a6, and it's often a good idea to develop the kingside knight first, kind of wait for white to put their cards on the table, and then to see, because sometimes you actually can play without a6 for a long time. You can develop your entire kingside, and then when the time is right, you can play a6. What you will often find uh, is that you are, you're able to save a tempo on the move a6, because oftentimes white gets cold feet and ends up taking the knight uh, of their own volition. So multiple ways that we can develop our kingside. Uh, e6 and bishop e7 is obviously one obvious method. Another pretty obvious method is to go g6 and bishop to g7, fianchettoing the bishop. Really multiple ways to play, and I think they're all kind of interchangeable. As a knight orf player, I like to play e6. I'm kind of partial to uh, this Scheveningen setup. But if you're kind of a dragon-minded player, there was nothing wrong with fianchettoing uh, the bishop either. So bishop to e7. Uh, Obviously, this ends the pin against the other knight, and we are now prepared to castle kingside. Now, the way that white is developing here is pretty natural, but not particularly dangerous for us. Okay, e5. Maybe you noticed the move, this move earlier, and it scared you. Uh, there is nothing to be scared of, because all of our minor pieces are protecting each other. And so moves like e5 are going to lead uh, to a series of trades, right? White's going to trade a bunch of minor pieces. And what tends to happen at the end of those trades is that we have better control over the center than white does. Because we have a pawn on c5, right, if we, if we reason from basic principles. And white has a pawn on d3. So often we're going to get this clamp on the d4 square, which is going to allow us to put long-term positional pressure on white. Very, very modest advantage, uh, of course, is, is what we're talking about here. So d takes c5. I'm assuming white will recapture with a knight. Yep. Now here again... I think some of you might be inclined to play a6 and try to force the bishop off of b5. But remember, there is a much more elegant and productive way to get rid of this pin, and that is just simply to castle. Just castle kingside, killing two birds with one stone. 
Now we are threatening to take the knight on e5, so white, white's hand is forced. And here, actually, we have a choice. We don't have to take back with a bishop. As a matter of fact, it could be an ingenious idea to take back with a knight, not because we're expecting a pre-move of some sort, but because later on we might try to use this bishop as a target or uh, to try to get white to take on d7, leading to a good bishop versus bad knight scenario. Uh, so both options are totally viable. Bishop takes d7 and knight takes d7. Um, my instinct is that knight takes d7 might be a little bit inferior from an objective standpoint, but I actually want to try it out. I kind of want to show you how a visually unappealing move like this can actually work out in the long run. Hopefully, of course, it does work out if I follow it up properly. Thank you, Min, for the raid. We're doing a little speed run here to end the stream. Okay, so queen takes e7. Pretty boring game so far. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't blame you for yawning. But as I've said before in previous speedruns, winning positions like this constitutes a really, really important part of moving to the intermediate level. Being able to play boring positions and outplay your opponent, uh, even in situations kind of devoid of tactical excitement. So knight to e4, I think, is actually... A uh, pretty big step in the wrong direction. My eyes are squarely focused on this bishop on b5, but what do I notice about it? Well, one important thing is that it's kind of confined. Uh, so if we were to play the move a6 here, white would probably be best advised to take on d7. If white doesn't, we're able to play b5, push the bishop away to b3, then c4 is kind of hanging in the air. We could fianchetto our light squared bishop, uh, and then we'd, we'd actually be threatening uh, to win a piece in that position. Bishop takes c4 and c4. But we can try to maximize the pressure here by moving the knight away from d7, because that is white's kind of escape ramp, is bishop takes d7. If we move our knight, a6 becomes uh, a very big problem for white. <clears throat> so the question is then, well, where do we move our knight? And there's multiple good squares, right? We can centralize it with knight e5. We can go knight f6. That's kind of the positional move. But I think the move which carries the most pain for white is knight to b6. Um, maybe I should have played knight e5, because this does block the b7 pawn. But a6 is now, OK, it doesn't win the game. It, it forces white's bishop to drop back to c4. But in that situation, we could already trade on c4 and completely cripple white's queenside pawn structure. We could also set up a6 by positioning a rook on d8 and x-raying the queen. And then a6 would actually be a winning threat. So this already starts to pose pretty serious problems to white. And you can tell that our opponent, I think, is sensing the danger and immediately panics with queen to g4. <clears throat> now, what's funny is that this move does not directly blunder a piece. Why not? Because f5 can be met with queen g5, funnily enough. I don't know if our opponent saw this or not. Sorry, I'm talking for too long. f5 can be met with queen g5. So instead of playing f5, we have a couple of things that we can do instead. I think we have a really ingenious tactical idea. Now, in situations when you have a move like this that almost works, what you need to be looking for is essentially a way to set it up. What does that mean? Well. If we were to play a move like queen to d8 or queen to c7 and try to move our queen onto a defended square, the likelihood is that white would smell a rat and would then get out of the potential fork. So often, you need to look at the other side of the board, and oftentimes you want to open up like a tactical front on the other side of the board, which is then going to make your idea work. What move am I really hinting at? I'm hinting at the move c4, which is a, a very advanced move. I think that most of you probably either maybe notice this move, but aren't really understanding why it's significant, what is the point of this move. But if you look carefully, you should notice that with white's king stuck in the center, the potential check on b4 is an incredibly unpleasant idea. So what we're doing is opening up a potential escape route for our own queen, which would then allow us to evade the move queen to g5 with a check. This check also incidentally forks the bishop and the king, and is going to lead, finally, to direct material gain. Because the knight has to cover, and then we can take b2 with another fork. Incidentally, that fork still 
does not immediately win a minor piece because of this move king to d2. But if white has to play a move like king d2, it should be pretty clear that his days are numbered. So the winning idea here was c4, and I'll, I'll talk more about it after the game. Let's take on b2, forking the knight and the rook. And after king d2, we still have, we still have some work to do. We absolutely still have some work to do because our queen is not entirely safe. We're only up a, a pawn. And the king is not going to get checkmated in the center by itself. Now, will our opponent find king d2? I don't know. He might resign. Yeah, castles. Yeah, king d2 is a pretty difficult move, I think, for a, a 1200 to find. And again, I, I won't keep going through the, the basics of how to convert a position like this. You know, at 1300, you should be pretty comfortable converting this type of position with black, even with like two minutes on your clock. Now, of course, nothing happened to this bishop. It's still there. It's still sitting on b5, and it's still very much attackable. Yes, that is a reference to the, the song that has dominated the top 100 billboard charts now for many years. Now, white actually can extricate the bishop with c5, but this would lead simply to further simplifications, which are beneficial to black. And thank you to our opponent for resigning promptly. All right. So anytime we face an opening variation for the first time, the, like the game in my presentation is going to be a little bit clunky because I'm trying to capture a lot of different details and elements in, in, in one game. And so I'm kind of talking a lot and on many different topics. Uh, but it is pretty important uh, for me to kind of lay the groundwork because we're definitely going to face uh, the Moscow variation probably more than once in the speedrun. So... Again, if you're a Sicilian player and you're more advanced and you already have learned uh, an alternate line and you like it, then you can continue playing it. Right? Bishop d7 and knight c6, to a lesser extent, are very much playable lines. And if you've learned them, you can continue playing them. My recommendation, though, is uh, the most principled move, which is knight to d7. I think it's the most exciting line, and it's the one that people don't like to face. A little bit of theoretical uh, background. Again, the point of knight d7 is that you do not want to play into white's hands by offering an exchange of bishops. What you want is, after the move a6, to grab the bishop pair uh, by trying to compel white to take the knight on d7, uh, even though this move may seem a little bit awkward. Now, if you look at the database, um, the most popular move actually is castle's kingside. Up until a couple years ago, it was d4. Um, but recently, almost all the top players uh, our castle and king side, which actually carries a completely different idea from the move d2, d4. Uh, also very popular is the move c3. Uh, again, very Alapin-esque idea, just trying to control the center. And to a lesser extent, uh, strong players have tried a4. This actually has gotten very fashionable recently. It's a very positional line. And even bishop to a4, a seemingly mysterious move, uh, has been essayed by some top players. So <laughs> this is an extremely theoretical line, and I certainly don't have the time uh, nor you know, the energy to, uh, nor does anyone have the desire, I think, uh, to spend like two hours right now learning the theory. Uh, so I'll limit myself to a few kind of cursory variations just to give you some background. Uh, D4 uh, is the traditional main line. And in response to D4, you take on D4. And typically, the point of the Moscow variation is to recapture with the queen. Now, you might say, well, doesn't white typically recapture with the knight? Well, yes, in the open Sicilian, white takes back with the knight, right? Here, queen takes d4 is a much less common sideline than knight takes d4. But with the inclusion of these two moves, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for white to take on d4. Why? Because if we proceed along like knight or lines, knight f6, knight c3, um, black plays a6, and this move now comes with tempo. So it begs the question, why did you put the bishop on b5 if white, black is going to play the knight orf anyway? Now this move comes with tempo, and white loses time. And trading on d7 here doesn't really make sense. You've made two moves with your bishop. You've traded it with, uh, for a knight that's only moved once, and you're helping black develop the queen side. So black is completely fine here. Now it's not like white is worse. Right? White castles... Uh, and you get a very, like, knight orf esque position where black is in absolutely no danger and probably is the one fighting for the advantage. So for this reason, the players in the no typically take on d4 with the queen. Here, uh, you're supposed to play a6. 
You don't want to procrastinate on this move in this position, because the longer the bishop sits on b5, uh, the more unpleasant various ideas such as e4, e5 are going to become. So here again, bishop to a4 is totally senseless because you just push this bishop away with b7, b5, a move that you want to play anyway. And that, of course, also opens up a nice fianchetto square for your bishop, bishop b7, black is fine. So virtually forced is bishop takes d7 check. Um, if you're a high-rated player, you might know that bishop e2 has been tried uh, by some GMs, but you're very unlikely to face this move at an intermediate level. Um, and again, I don't have the time to, to talk about every sideline. So after bishop takes d7, bishop takes d7, you get this very sort of unique position where, again, there's a branching off point. And again, the old main line is now essentially discredited, and it's the move c4. Trying to set up this sort of Morozzi bind like pawn formation. And if you give white a few moves, white's going to clamp down on a lot of these light squares. And so black needs to act very, very decisively. And here what you have to know is, first of all, to develop your knight to f6. Um, let's say that white develops their knight to c3. Now, there are several ways that you can handle this position, but I like the fianchetto g6, immediately targeting the queen on d4. Let's say white castles. Black develops the bishop to g7, and black has absolutely no problems. White usually drops the queen back to d3. It's a good idea to put the rook on c8. And one of white's biggest problems in this position is that b3 is almost always impossible either because of b5 or, in this situation, because of what tactic. Let's see if anybody can spot a pretty prosaic but very important tactical resource. And you should try to find this uh, and pause the video if you can. Very good. People are sharp. Knight takes e4. Simple, but very instructive. If the queen takes, we take on c3 uh, with an extra pawn. If the knight takes, this is just a clear extra exchange. And uh, you should not be afraid of a move like bishop to h6 here, because the black bishop has plenty of spots, such as e5, and white has insufficient compensation uh, for the exchange. So this is not very dangerous. Bishop to g5 in this position is more common and carries a little bit more, more teeth. And here, of course, you shouldn't play g6 because this allows white to force a very awkward pawn structure. Here, instead, you should play e6. And you're never really afraid of bishop takes f6 in this version because after queen takes f6, you get an endgame where black gets what's called a rouser pawn structure, which to the sort of uninitiated eye may seem very clunky and it may seem like white is positionally better. But you should not be afraid of getting this pawn structure, particularly in an endgame, because it's insanely solid. There's no actual weaknesses, particularly if you put your bishop on e7. And of course, you have two bishops against white's two knights. And if the position opens up, the bishops are going to tear the knights apart. And the position is going to open up, um, because inevitably, black is going to play b7, b5, and kind of initiate the queenside attack. So for instance, let's say white goes knight c3. Black's position collapses really quickly here. Rook to c8, and the moment white plays b3, you push b5, the c4 pawn is under fire. Can't take because the knight drops. If white tries to defend the pawn, the bishop comes out to h6, and nobody really cares about this particular pawn structure. So as a knight or a flare, and as a Sicilian player more broadly, the pawn structure should not be your primary concern. And this particular rouser structure, uh, which is called that way because... Uh, of a different variation of the Sicilian called the Rouser, or the classical Sicilian, um, which is very much playable, and there are some good chessable courses on it, knight to c6. And in this particular Sicilian, if we follow the main line, which is bishop g5, e6, queen d2, many, many times, most more often than not, uh, at some point, the black queen moves away from d8, and very often, white responds by capturing on f6, reaching exactly this uh, typical pawn structure, which immediately signals to you that it came from a rouser. So hopefully that makes sense. I know I've gone kind of deep into this line, but um, I think the context is, is really important. So we're looking at takes takes. We looked at c4. Of course, the other way that white can develop is knight to c3, just eschewing uh, this Morozzi setup altogether and instead prioritizing development. And here you make a move which to a knight or player is quite natural to a knight or player might seem completely anti-positional. You play the move e5. So you chase the queen away from d4. And I've already explained on more than one occasion how this move is not as anti-positional as it looks, in large part because white is going to have a very, very hard time 
maintaining a grip on the d5 square. So once the queen drops back, typically it drops back to d3. The only thing that you have to remember here is not to play the move knight f6. This is a very serious mistake in this position. Who can explain why? And this, of course, is what I call the Smyslov Rudakovsky maneuver. Why is knight f6 playing right into white's hands? Yeah, so this is a pretty basic positional idea that you should be very acquainted with. It's because after bishop to g5, white is able to trade the knight on f6 and establish a really, really nasty outpost on d5. So you need to keep your knight in order to fight for the d5 square. Um, what is Smyslov versus Rudakovsky? Well, that's a very classical, famous game. I've shown it on actually several occasions on stream. And at this point, it gets pretty stale, but it's like the classic illustration of this concept. And it actually incidentally came from a knight orf where black committed this very error. So in this position, a young Vasily Smyslov plays the move bishop to g5. Then he exchanges on f6 and he plants this monster of a knight on d5. And he wins the game in, in due course. So instead of this, um, instead of this, black has a couple of approaches here, I think, that equalize. But the, the new move, I think the move that Stockfish gives uh, in recent times, and the move that scores really well is to start with rook c8. Very flexible move, putting the rook on a great square. And if white jumps into d5 with the knight, this is no longer dangerous at all for several reasons, such as the fact that black can now bring the knight to f6. And you might be like, well, wait a second, what's the difference? Here, white plays bishop g5. But black can solve his problems tactically by delivering a really important check on a5. Actually, not yet. There has to be a move that is included first. Why is queen a5 check bad? Instructive moment. Why did I confuse this? What does white actually do here? And it's not what you might think. It's not bishop to d2. That's not the issue. It's b4, exactly. b4, the queen is pushed aside, and then white is able to take on f6. The point is, if white drops the bishop back, the queen moves back to d8, and you get this game of chicken where both sides keep repeating the set of moves. Um, so for this reason, it's important for black to plant a bishop on b5 first. This is actually the concrete significance of the move rook c8, right? This is what it means to understand an opening. Because rook c8 is a useful move, and you should kind of understand, yeah, it's a, it's a good rook, but there is also a very specific idea behind this move, which is that any time the knight goes to d5, you can play the move bishop b5 without fearing the move c2, c4. So you're controlling the c4 square, and this becomes important here because of the move bishop to b5. And only after the queen moves uh, do you give the check on a5. The queen has to keep the c2 pawn protected, if the queen moves back to d2, there's this very typical tactic, knight takes e4, and you simply win a pawn. And after queen b3, it's time to deliver the check, which most likely leads to a repetition of moves because white has nothing better to do. White can't castle, so white is the one who has to fight for the draw here and repeat moves. All right, so I will just show one other line. This is a, a quick overview of the old main line. Now I'm quickly going to show what to do if white castles kingside. This is a more advanced move, castles kingside. Uh, here, the one thing to remember is you should play the move a6 in this position, which is not something that is possible to figure out on your own. You have to just like know this. Why on earth is knight f6 in inaccuracy? Does anybody know the actual reason that knight f6 is considered clearly inferior to a6? And the reason is, of course, very positional. It's not like, oh, white wins the game with e5 or something. But why is it so important to start with a6? It's kind of a cool reason. Yes, very good. The poison pawn got it. So the actual reason is knight f6 can be met with rook e1. And the point is that if black plays a6 now, the white bishop is able to tuck itself away on f1. And now white is able to implement a very annoying idea, which as Alapin players, which of course all of you watching the speedrun are, now are, uh, either because I've converted you or uh, because you've come to the realization it's the best Sicilian, white wants to go c3 and d4. And this is a very hard idea to stop. Let's say black plays e6, white will now play uh, c3, and white will occupy the center with d4. Now, is this a disaster? 
after something like bishop e74 is black losing obviously not black is only a tiny bit worse and if you look with the with the engine after b5 black can equalize with really really accurate play but i still think it's a little bit unpleasant and there's no need to allow this because you're able to play the move a6 immediately sorry castles a6 now the f1 square is unavailable to the white bishop so you might say well can't the bishop just go back to e2? What's the difference? Well, the difference is that here, knight gf6 immediately hits the pawn on e4, and rook e1 is no longer effective. And if white plays knight c3, well, then obviously you can't put a pawn on c3, and you can target the knight with a quick uh, storm of the b pawn. Uh, bishop a4, of course, loses a bishop uh, to b5 and c4, which was a theme in the game. And if white takes on d7, well, Controlling the center hits different when you're the one controlling the bishop pair. So technically, white can do this, but here you're really not as afraid of white pushing d2, d4. So you can go knight f6, white goes rook e1, now you can safely go e6, let's say white goes d4. And there's many, many things that black can do here, but without a light squared bishop, white's control over the center is not scary at all. You can just keep developing with bishop e7, and one important kind of difference is that without the light squared bishop you're never worried about white pushing e5 because were there a bishop on d3 white would have a very nasty idea of setting up a battery against the h7 pawn as it stands black controls the light squares and we're really really happy okay um so that's kind of the lay of the land typically for that reason white plays this very awkward looking move bishop to d3 this is the modern main line and this sets off some very, very complicated theory. Here you're supposed to go knight g to f6. Now, white most of the time plays rook e1, trying to go bishop f1, even though it wastes the tempo. And among other things, you can go e6, bishop f1, b5, and you basically like beat white to the punch. Because if white now plays c3, you're able to fianchetto your bishop just in time and hit this pawn. White is unable to play d4. And if white has to go d3, well, clearly this is a pretty non-threatening setup. And uh, that's enough theoretical overview for now. Uh, we didn't get to some of the other moves, such as c3 uh, immediately, or bishop to a4, or a4. Uh, but we'll leave that for subsequent explorations. I'm sure we'll face this again. Let's take a look at the game continuation. So knight c3 is a very non-threatening move. We responded with knight f6. Now here, once again, white should probably go d4. and take the game back into kind of theoretical lines you're going to take on d4. And after a6, you transpose back into the main line. Takes, takes, and bishop g5, e6. We just looked at this position, um, or at a similar position. In any case, white pushes d3. We respond with e6. Notice that we're not hurrying the move a6. And black's position is totally fine here. So e5, again. White didn't make any serious mistakes until later in the middle game, but I already think that black, white's position is a little bit worse because of our superior control uh, over the center. Um, and after knight takes d7, we responded with this kind of creative recapture, knight takes d7. Probably bishop takes d7 is a little bit better, as I said. Uh, white trades, and you get a really, really nice, comfortable position with a great clamp on the d4 square. Um, but we decided to take with a knight, and in this position, the beginning uh, of the end occurs. It's only move 11, but in the next few moves, white just loses the game spontaneously. The correct approach for white, of course, would have been just a castle. We would have pushed a6, probably a trade would have occurred, and then we would have planted our bishop on this lovely commanding post on c6. Instead, white starts looking for adventures without having castled and without having a single target in our camp. So knight e4, uh, knight b6, and queen to g4 was still, I think, not the decisive mistake. I think after c4, if white responds accurately, white is still very much okay. But responding accurately here is extremely hard. Extremely hard. I just checked with the engine, and actually, <laughs> technically c4 is not the best move, but white's correct response is not a move that was on my radar at all. So let's see if anybody can actually find uh, the way for white to maintain uh, dynamic equality here. White is not worse with the correct move. But it's far from easy. 
It's yes, very good. One of you got it. It's actually Long Castle, which honestly I didn't see at all. Um, and the point is just to get the king out of the checking zone of Black's king uh, of Black's queen. Now, once again, if f5, white still has this resource, queen to g5, and white is totally fine. Very importantly, if black now plays queen to b4, white is able to stabilize with knight to c3. And of course, remember that a6 is not going to trap the bishop because the bishop can just capture on c4. So the position here is extremely complicated. I mean, black can, for example, take on d3 and then push e5, opening up the light squared bishop. It's just a very unclear position. The last thing I want to point out, of course, in the game, white just kind of collapses with queen f3 and allows immediate devastation after queen b4 check. But one last point I wanted to make is what would have been our response to bishop takes c4? What is the actual proper way to punish white here? And it's actually kind of boring. And believe it or not, this is sort of a trick question. What would you do here with black? What would you do here with black? So the way that I pitched it during the game, I presented it as though I was trying to make f5 work. In reality, I realize now that f5 is incorrect, even in this position. If you play f5 now, uh, or let's say you take on c4 and then play f5, after queen to g5, the move that I was relying on, queen b4 check, and I did miss this, white is able to block with a knight and essentially escape scot-free. Now, black is not worse. Black is still probably better after queen takes b2. But it turns out that there's no reason to play f5 here. You can just directly check on b4, and this is much, much better. Because, well, if white blocks with the knight here, this is clearly a superior version of that position, because you don't have the weakening move f5 thrown in, and you're also going to take the pawn on c2. If white blocks with the pawn, Similarly, black takes on b2. And finally, if white castles, having patiently waited for the right moment, you push f5. And here, the queen has no way to evacuate while challenging black's queen. So it's really as simple as that. Um, the theme, though, is an important one. When you have a move on one side of the board that almost works, but fails because of some very specific kind of tactical defense, oftentimes, Either, create, either distracting your opponent on the other side of the board or creating the preconditions for some tactical operation on the other side of the board, like activating a piece or opening up a, a check like we did here, can be a very, very effective method of making that idea work. Now, you might have listened to this and said, well, I want an example because I want to see what this looks like in sort of a different situation. Here is just one example off the top of my head from an old and very well-known game. Well, not very well-known game, but very well-known player. Pilnik versus Karras, one of the top players in the world. And in this position, it is black to play. So take a moment. If you're watching on YouTube, just pause the video. Ask yourself, what would you do um, if you had the black pieces in this position? Clearly, black is attacking. But how do you capitalize on uh, your massive piece activity and all the light score weaknesses in white's territory? So in the interest of time, I will point out that knight f3 check, which is very, very tempting, does not work. Why? Because after bishop takes f3, e takes f3, queen takes f3, you might be enticed by rook e1. But white blockades with queen g2 or even queen d3, and the attack has reached a dead end. So knight f3, knight g4, both of these moves almost work, but white has just enough resources to keep the knight at bay. And so the correct approach is to look at the other side of the board and basically ask yourself, well, what, is, what piece is not participating in the attack? Well, quickly, you should notice the bishop. And so the move b4 uh, comes pretty naturally once that observation is made. The point is that if white takes on b4, you now can start with the move bishop to b5, hitting the knight uh, on f1. If the bishop blocks, now you simply trade. Actually, here, knight f3 check is even more effective, or, or maybe knight g4. But if white moves the knight, now you definitely do play knight f3 check. And it works like a charm, because after the trade, uh, because of the involvement of the bishop, the knight has moved away from the first rank, and the rook now delivers checkmate in two moves. So just one of many examples I could give you on the general topic of whole board awareness. Both sides of the board 
are interconnected in kind of many hidden ways. And you should think of the board as kind of one unit, if that makes sense. One very quick example, just to cap this off, because I think it's a really important theme. And even though we're spending a while on this game, I, I think it's uh, really worth illustrating uh, the importance of whole board awareness in almost every situation. Here is one of my proudest applications of this concept. So this is an old game of mine. It's a crazy position. And again, I won't spend too long on this because I do want to get one more game in. And we got Yasser himself in the chat. So suddenly I'm, <laughs> suddenly I'm nervous. Uh, but in this game, I have the white pieces. And clearly, white has built up a what should be a completely crushing attack on, on the king side. This should be a completely crushing attack. If you just look at the number of pieces which are involved, essentially all of them are involved. And if you look carefully at the king side, a very typical tactical pattern should quickly manifest itself in your brain. This is sort of a textbook pattern that often leads either to checkmate or to decisive gain of material. What are we talking about? We're talking about what move? What move are we talking about? It's also a queen sacrifice, which makes it more exciting. Yeah, queen to e6. So giving up the queen. And so I was calculating this and I was getting excited because after king h8, you know, I was confident at first that something would materialize. But in fact, windmills can be a very overrated tactical concept because oftentimes they're overly, they're kind of over glorified in tactical books, but in kind of real life, they don't really lead anywhere other than perpetual check. You can take on e5, congrats, but you can't win black's queen and you certainly can't deliver checkmate. You can keep returning for f7, but all of the gold has been extracted. But applying the theme here yields a really, really cool move. Now, it's not the only winning move. White can win in many different ways here. Uh, even like the prosaic d takes e5 wins the game. But I found a really beautiful way to involve both sides of the board and to activate a piece that wasn't sort of expecting to be involved in this attack. And this idea makes the move queen e6 check work to perfection. So I've seen a couple of people already point this move out. Can anybody name this move once again? We are talking about rook e3 to b3. So you start with this nice little rook sacrifice. Black essentially has to take it, otherwise the knight on b2 just drops. And now, of course, rook takes e6 is totally winning. I should point this out. But, of course, how can you miss the opportunity for a queen sack? Queen e6 trick, this is what happened in the game. And with the involvement of the rook on c2, this leads to checkmate. But you got to be careful. The correct move here is knight to d6 check, slicing off the black queen. Why is this important? Because if you start with a check, black can prolong the game by blocking with the queen. So you give this check, now the rook delivers the final blow. And ironically enough, it's not smothered mate that decides the game, it's just a regular back rank mate. Again, both sides of the board are interrelated, and seemingly insignificant factors can make all of the difference, such as the fact that this knight on b2 is a very vulnerable piece. It might not seem important, but it was actually an integral part of the combination. It's pretty nice. Yeah, that's how the game ended. That's, that's what happened. Uh, rook b3 and queen e6. So I was uh, pretty happy with this combination. That's where I'll conclude that illustrative segment. Let's play one more five minute game. We'll do a quick one and then we'll wrap up for the night. It's been a long stream, especially since we got royalty in the house. And here we go. Okay, so we have white against AVZ. Good luck. Let's see if we can get another Glex system. And by another Glex system, I basically mean like our, maybe our second or third Glex system of the speed run. Finally, we're not facing a Philidor. Um, very refreshing. Okay, so Bishop E7 is, uh, this is a very modest setup, which is not sort of inherently wrong. It's just really, really passive. And it lets us do anything that we want to do. Um, I've already kind of laid the theoretical groundwork in the GLEC. We faced uh, the more topical move, bishop to c5, uh, bishop to b4, as well as d7, d5 are sort of black's three main lines. So let's begin by kind of playing the typical GLEC moves. We start by castling. 
Um, it's not a bad idea to throw in the move h3 at some point as well. But all of this depends on where black positions the light squared bishop. So bishop e6 um, immediately calls forth the tempting response d4. But what's funny is that in the gleck, you want to be very careful about pushing d4. Not because black is going to trade everything on d4. That plays right into our hands. But because in response to d4, there can be a very nasty idea to put the bishop on g4, even at the cost of a tempo, and try to force us to, to close up the center with d5, which is very much not in the spirit of the gleck. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, why is bishop g4 so nasty? Well, because the d4 pawn suddenly hangs. And if we have to take on e5, well, that's just a boring move, which is going to lead to some mass exchanges. Uh, so instead of d4, we have a couple of options. We can push d3, or we can keep our options open by playing the move h3. And of course, preparing to play d4. Black plays h6, and now d4 should work like a charm because it threatens a fork and essentially compels black to trade on d4, leading to a very pleasant position for us. But let's not forget to defend the pawn on h3. A lot of players here castle queenside and blunder the a7 pawn. I've seen this mistake committed a lot. OK, so black is trying to attack us on the king's side. But this is another benefit to playing the gleck system. If you know it well, uh, you'll know that this type of quote unquote attack is actually not an attack at all because black doesn't threaten anything. In response to h4, we can just push g4. And most of the time, sacrifices, like bishop takes g4, are totally futile because black's position is too passive, there aren't enough attackers, and our king is way too safe for a sacrifice like that to work. So how do we proceed? How do we fight for the initiative ourselves? Well, anytime you see this arrangement, you should notice that the bishop on e6 is out of squares. And so the move, I think, stems naturally from that observation. f4 looks like a great way to grab some space and create a really nasty threat of winning the game. Push him, baby. And you're like, is this a really actually hard move to defend against? Yeah, it is. As long as you keep this escape square away from Black's bishop, f5 is going to be a huge threat. That tells you where we should put our queen. We should put it on d3, keeping the c4 square protected and preventing Black from also pushing b5. Not that b5 would have been a dangerous move anyway because of e5. So black plays g6, and of course that doesn't actually defend against f5. The game is over. And another Gleck system win is in the cards. Let's go. E takes f5, the bishop is trapped. Our bishop is now fully opened up. And c4 doesn't actually do anything. We can slide our queen to f3. But a simpler move is actually just to take on e6, hitting the queen on d7. Easy clap. Queen takes e6. Now, of course, we should move our queen. Now, repositioning it to f3, the one thing that you should be a little careful about is anytime you have a king on h2 and it's getting x-rayed like so, you should, of course, keep a very close eye on any potential checks on g4. Just a mental note that you should make to yourself. Knight g4 can come very suddenly, and it can be very nasty in certain situations. Not here because the king can just slide away to g1, but there's no need to, for us to expose ourselves to this kind of tactic. Instead, let's put on our Russian schoolboy hats and just put, play queen f5. I think this is much more to the point. And the queen trade cannot be avoided. Now, there's no reason for us to take on e6 ourselves um, because it rectifies black's pawn structure and helps black build a nasty little pawn ch chain in the center. Instead, I think it's much more prudent to play bishop g5, hitting the knight. Very likely this will lead to a further gain of material. Queen takes f5, rook takes f5. Okay, knight g4 check. Our opponent still tries this move, but here we can just take. As long as the g1 square isn't controlled, um, this is typically not going to be a dangerous proposition. We don't need to take the queen. We simply take the bishop. Again, we always need to keep an eye out for the a7 g1 diagonal. But as long as you can avoid checks on that diagonal, your king is perfectly safe, and we're simply up two minor pieces. Let's bring our rook into the center and try to deploy it on the seventh rank just to expedite the process. 
And this one's over. Also, rook takes f7 is coming through. It's over. So the game is over completely. Rook is seven. And hopefully our opponent resigns here. Yeah. Even simpler than rook takes b7 is to play rook takes f7. Now, for most of you, I would recommend just to take on b7. No need to be pedantic, but uh, that's my job in the speedrun, is to be pedantic and as accurate as possible. So d5, okay. All right, I'm too lazy. Let's just take on b7 and win the queen. And now we are just taking everything that we see. Anything that's hanging, we can capture with check. And uh, let's hunt down the king. We give one check on f6. Shepherding the king to a5. Okay, it goes to c5. And what's the fastest mate here? We can go queen c6, king d4. It can be kind of frustrating uh, to try to deliver you know, the fastest possible mate. So you shouldn't bog, bog yourself down too much. You should just kind of... There's no art to it. Just deliver checks, and eventually it's going to be mate. Just watch. I'm going to give the first check that comes to mind, knight b5 check. And, okay, black walks right into checkmate. But had black run over to e3, I, would have, I was planning queen c5 check, and then like queen to d4 check. And actually, the king now hides on c1, so I didn't do a very good job of proving the point. But eventually, it is actually going to be mate. Like eventually, we're going to get something like this. And yeah, here I finally think it's forced mate after something like this. Or the other way around, queen c1 and knight c3 is actually kind of a pretty mate. Uh, you can do the analysis on your own here. Uh, that wasn't the important part of the game. But you can see that even at this pretty decent level, the Gleck is working like a charm. Because people who don't know what to play against it, they often default to a very passive setup, thinking that it's going to be solid. But uh, it has kind of the opposite effect. It lets us do everything that we want to do and leads to kind of a really miserable position for Black. So just the important takeaway is that you don't necessarily need to prevent black from playing bishop to g4. Because if black plays bishop g4 here, now we play h3. And in this type of situation, there's nothing wrong with pushing g4 and kicking the bishop away to a very passive square. But if you want to play the move d4, then and only then is it an important idea to prevent bishop g4. Because d4, bishop g4 is not a scenario that we want to allow. Because d5 allows the knight to jump into d4. Let's say we play bishop b3. Black trades everything. And we get this very like King's Indian-esque closed center structure. Which is obviously not worse for us. But this is not the kind of structure or kind of position that you want to get out of a Gleck. Um, if you don't want to play h3. And you don't want to bother with the move d4. There is nothing wrong with playing you know, the more traditional setup with d3. But this definitely doesn't maximize the advantage. And um, here, black can start preparing d5 on their own accord. So after h3, black kind of missed uh, the purpose of that move. They played the very passive h6. And I think after the trade on d4, black's position is incredibly hard to play, unless you're, you know, a strong player, a master. Um, black should probably castle kingside. But here, uh, among many things that we can do, we can fianchetto the other bishop and just start imposing our will in the center. Black is essentially paralyzed as long as he's unable to break free with d5. And then we can push f4, deploy the rooks into the center. I'm sure we'll get many more chances to um, prosecute the positional advantage in these types of positions. But it's time for me to go. It's really late. I want to play title Tuesday tomorrow and get some sleep. Uh, the rest of the game was pretty straightforward. At this point, Black, Black's position is already a disaster. Uh, maybe the game could have been prolonged with a move like queen c8. But... Now, you can do the analysis on your own. I think uh, you got the point, and the conversion process was really straightforward as well. Um, all right, just two games today, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed the, uh, the Moscow variation game, and hopefully your faith in the Gleck system was reaffirmed by the second game. On that note, I will end the stream. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you guys later. Bye.